I'm live. The countdown happened twice. Maybe I'm live. Maybe I'm not live. This is Chris Grimm. This is Deep Work Fast. And every week I come to you with tools, ideas, and concepts to help you be the best that you can be at work and at home in all the roles that you play. Parent, partner, boss, employee, team member, all of them. I want you to be at your best. This week, I dropped a blog yesterday, always. Uh, and the blog this week is called The Top Three Ways Successful Women Undermine Their Own Success. Hi, Blake. Thank you. Yes, I am live now. <laughs> uh, anyway, so um, this is good for everybody. So whether you are a man or a woman, please stay here with me. Last week, I, I talked about the top three ways that are most common for men who are successful to unintentionally undermine their own authority, their own success. And this week I wanted to focus on women. Although if you listen to both or read both blogs, you're going to see that it could be anyone using them. I just kind of wanted to categorize them because in our coaching, 28 years, uh, we have a lot of experience coaching men. And in the last probably 10 or 15 years, more women in leadership more women in our business that pay for personal coaching. And so I wanted to create some balance. And so this week, I am going to focus on three behaviors that I'm going to break down in a few minutes here. It's in the blog. It's like a two minute read. And the link, thank you, Heather, uh, is in the chat. So I just want to talk about these three. I'm going to break them down. I'm going to talk about what they look and sound like in real life. Uh, I'm going to try if I have time to give you examples, both in the workplace and at home. Um, like I said, this can be behaviors used by a man or a woman, but they are very common to women. So this week I'm going to focus on these. You have probably seen these before. And if you are not a woman and you're listening, I don't want you to go away because most likely you have people around you who are using these behaviors. And like I said, they are unintentionally undermining themselves. So let's talk about the first one. Using the words, I'm sorry as a default. That is also known as apologizing as a primary response. So I want to take both the words. So I want to do like a 1A and 1B here with you, because I do think that for some people, since I've been coaching people a long time, I get to often kind of unwind why people are doing things. So the words, I'm sorry, for English speakers, and for a lot of women in particular, but I do think some men do this, is that it becomes a default language response. And so it's used in a lot of ways and in a lot of situations that aren't actually apologizing. Right? So think about it. Some people say, I'm sorry, as a first response to any person maybe telling them about a situation that wasn't great. And maybe they didn't have anything to do with it. But the first response when that person is telling you about the situation, because you have empathy, maybe you have compassion, maybe you feel bad that they experienced that, you say, I'm sorry. The other way people use those words, and I, I see it a little bit less now, but boy, when we were co-located and everybody was in offices together, if you think about those times, when your door, your office door was open and you're sitting in your office and you're working and maybe someone goes down the hall and they need to talk to you about something. They need to bring you something. They need to maybe get five minutes of your time. Often people would say, hey, I'm sorry. Need to talk to you about this. Right. So so culturally, it just became language that we would put in as a placeholder, even though we weren't apologizing for something. And I'm bringing it up as a part of this because I think it's not a great idea. In fact, I know for a fact, specifically when I coach women leaders, that using the words, I'm sorry, all the time can actually undermine you. Because by saying I'm sorry, it does sound to the other people like you are apologizing for something. So think about that. To the listener, when we say I'm sorry, one, it can be confusing I've actually coached people before who told me that when their direct reports said they were sorry all the time, they were like, why are they apologizing? That makes me think they did something wrong. It cues a response from the listener 
that something actually is wrong or that you did something. And most likely you didn't. So why would you use those words? The other thing, like I was saying, using those words to comfort someone, like when they've had a bad situation and your response is, I'm sorry, it also is just the an inappropriate term to use. And often it's disingenuous because if you didn't do anything, why would you say you were sorry? It's not the right words to use. And so, of course, then it makes you inarticulate. So let's not do that anymore. I'm going to give you some options. One is if you're using it as a default because you do feel bad about interrupting someone or you feel bad about the situation they have and you just don't feel like you have other words, I want to give you some other words. And in the blog, I have some of these too, like replacing I'm sorry with, wow, this sounds like a really bad situation. So when we can just play back to the other person, what we think we've heard them say, it is neutral. It also, for many people, feels respectful. So I'm going to replace words that weren't getting you anything and sometimes are confusing people with words that will neutralize the situation. And specifically, if you don't need to apologize, stop using those words. Reserve apologetic words for when you actually need to apologize. Wouldn't that be a great idea? <laughs> like, let's use the right word for the right situation. And in these situations, like I said, neutralize it by reflecting back to the person what you've heard them say. Are you too busy for, to talk to me right now? When, when can we grab 10 minutes? Because this is important. That's another way you would do it. If you are in an office and you are doing those slide by the office, poke, poke your head in, do you have a minute? Instead of saying, I'm sorry for interrupting you, say, I've got something really important. When do you have 10 minutes? Feel the difference in those words. Feel it when you say those words, right? So if you're trying to get attention or you are trying to connect with a person, I want you to practice substituting other words for that. And like I said, holding I'm sorry sacred, using I'm sorry when you actually need to apologize. The second thing I want to talk to you about today that many people do, uh, a lot of women do, is downplaying accomplishments. Now, my goal for you is not to become arrogant or boastful. My goal is that you not be so humble that you refuse to take a compliment or that you are uh, afraid to own what you have actually done. So let's just break that down for a second. So super common and often uh, that, especially when I'm coaching up and coming people, and like I said, a lot of young women leaders, is that they tend to downplay what they've done. They downplay that they accomplished something. They don't really want to talk about it. It feels embarrassing. I don't need to boast. I don't want to look and feel like that. And so they don't know how to do that. They also oftentimes shy away from using strong language of accomplishment on their resume and on their LinkedIn. Now, for most of you, you're probably saying, I don't witness that in the world at all. And that is because probably for the last two to five years, we've had a lot of cultural push towards women, right? Lots of women leadership programs, lots of hashtag girl boss uh, all of those things. And so that influx of a new focus on female leaders has pushed a lot of people forward. And so I do see more and more people um, getting better or getting help <laughs> uh, at making sure that their LinkedIn, their resume, and when they're prepared to interview, that they learn how to be really comfortable talking about accomplishment. But if you're not putting it out there on LinkedIn resume or interviews, most people don't practice talking about their own accomplishments. So most people don't actually know how to do it. And so they shy away. It feels bad for a lot of people. I hear it in coaching all the time. Like, I don't want to go around telling people what I've accomplished. Well, guess what? 
uh, you might need to just learn to talk about it and think about it maybe in this way. You should know what you contribute. You should know your strengths. And if you don't, take something like Strengths Finder, or uh, I think I mentioned not maybe last week or can't remember. Anyway, Strengths Finder is an assessment. It's by the Gallup organization. Uh, there is a book called Discover Your Strengths by Marcus Buckingham. Uh, I, I definitely think on one of these we have that. Heather, if you still have the link, if you could put that in the chat, that would be great, right? Discover Your Strengths is a wonderful way for you to get the book, get the audio book. You can take the assessment for free with a link in the book. And it gives you language to help you talk about what you're good at. And I'm not talking about the most obvious things. I'm talking about what's great about your style, how you like to interact with people and why that's a strength. Everyone should know how to do that in an appropriate way so that you can understand, not just uh, on a team, but think about in the workplace in particular, even if you work at home, you work with other people. When you are collaborating with other people, it's a good thing to know what you're bringing to the table and to be able to talk about it in an articulate way, but also without getting embarrassed, without feeling like you have to tone it down. If you've done awesome things, if you've been a part of some really awesome things, and I know a lot of you have, because I know a lot of you, uh, you should be able to talk about it without feeling wonky. Okay, third thing. Uh, the lear third thing, and this is something I've been working on with a lot of women for a really long time. And some men have this, but I, I find this to be a kind of a female issue, which is putting yourself last to the point that you either are over-functioning or you sacrifice yourself too many times, like you're kind of the martyr or, you know, you're always the person who uh, puts in the extra time. So whether maybe it's a team project or doing one last proofread on the PowerPoint um, or in your home, picking up after people when they can't seem to do their own chores. They're all really great examples of ways that feels innocuous, sometimes feels like that's what we're supposed to be doing, but it can become habitual in our relationships. And what I find in the workplace, and I want to address this because I was actually just coaching someone about this recently, a young woman leader who is so used to kind of leaning in and doing everything for everybody. And we were at an offsite and at the offsite, she was also like cleaning up people's coffee cups and trash and and really just like over leaning into roles that were not her responsibility. And then when we were talking, she was asking me why the ex other executives didn't treat her like another executive. And I said, well, because you don't act like it. Ah, right. You have to see that in in work settings in particular, when women go into caretaking mode, or like I said, people pleasing mode, or that kind of nurturing mom mode where we can multitask, we want to get beyond the conversation and um, sometimes beyond the business that's going on because we see a mess maybe around us. Not uncommon, right? Like all of a sudden the conference table's got all these empty coffee cups and they've got trash and there's all these things going on. Most of the time, what you're going to see is that the meeting's going to go on and one of the women on the team, if they're in mom mode and it's bothering them, right? They can see all this trash. They can see all the things going on. They'll just clean it up. Now, I got to tell you, I get this because I have that mode too. And any one of us, whether you've had kids or not, that's not even what it's about. We kind of have a mode, some of us, that caretake, right? We want to nurture things. We want to clean things up. We want to do things beyond the linear, action-oriented um, business things that are going on. So I just want to say, one, don't do that, right? Really start to understand your role and where the boundaries of your role are. And I, I mean this in every way, and I'm really, really speaking to female leaders, but like I said, if you are not a female and you know that you do this, like maybe you people please too much, 
Maybe you take on responsibilities that technically aren't a part of your job. No one's asking you to do it, but you're picking up the pieces because you don't trust other people to do it. See, that's a part of this too. Over-functioning in the workplace, specifically on teams, often happens because we don't trust that the other people are going to do the stuff. And so the activity of doing all these things is, is one part of this problem. And I want to address the second part of this issue and why it undermines you. Because over time, most likely, you're going to be resentful about it. And when resentment builds up because we've been picking up the pieces for other people, we've been leaning in too much. Maybe the whole system is even incentivizing you to do that. Maybe people are happy that you're doing it, right? So I'm not talking about situations where people are telling you to knock it off or other people are kind of going, why is she, why is she always fixing the PowerPoint? No one's doing that. Most likely the team is benefiting from the over-functioning. And so when that happens, I also have coached many people who are exhausted And over time, get resentful, right? There's a bitterness that can build up when the story goes from you just kind of doing it because you want to get it done to you having to do it because you know if you don't do it, no one else will. And if I coach you, you know, oftentimes I'm like, time out. Is that even real? What would happen if you didn't overfunction? What if you actually stayed in your lane? And and sometimes the answer is, well, if I don't do it, it won't get done, or it'll be crappy, or X, Y, Z will happen. And sometimes, guess what? We need to let things happen so the whole team uh, lives the consequences of the reality of all of our behaviors and everything that we're doing so that the team has a chance to get better. So that's the last thing I want to talk about. All of these behaviors that we're talking about, like I said, most cases, the intention's actually good. Or you don't even think about it. They're so habitual, they're just showing up. And like I said, most likely you don't know in the moment. It's not until later you realize that you undermined yourself. You, you, You start to realize that, oh my God, I've been doing this this whole time and I'm not actually getting the results I want. Or maybe I'm not positioning myself to be promoted because now I'm getting feedback that I'm not strong, that I'm not articulate. Maybe you even get feedback that you overfunction, or you start to know that the vibe with the other people on the team, especially on that overfunctioning one, by the way, I can always tell when I'm working on a team, the people who are overfunctioning and doing stuff that other people should be doing because there's an anger vibe. Sometimes it's like deep And it's been there a long time, so it becomes dysfunction. But if it hasn't been going on for a long time, there could still be kind of a resentfulness vibe. And you hear it in the way people talk to each other and about each other. So these dynamics are very real, right? I'm not just saying that one person is doing this. These are things that we experience in coaching on a fairly regular basis. And we experience the downstream effects because I pro- so I do promise you that habitual use of these behaviors do undermine you you don't want to undermine yourself. Like, why would you want to do that? Self-sabotage is not anything anybody wakes up in the morning wanting to do. So what are we going to do about it? One, I want you to be honest with yourself. So check out the blog, rewatch this video. It uh, will be archived on YouTube and on Spotify now. So it's available to everybody all the time. They're always 20 minutes or less. The blogs are always like a two, three minute read. My first thing is always self-awareness. Be honest with yourself. Start to understand what of this is true for you. And if you don't know, uh, you could ask for feedback from people that you trust and who are objective that you work with or live with. Ask them if you do these things. Say, I think I do. I think I hear myself doing this all the time. Ask for the feedback and then start to see if you can regulate it on your own. And what that means, self-regulation, is that we start to be aware that we habitually are saying and doing certain things. And then we just create a new agreement with ourself and start to look at situations. Like maybe you make a deal with yourself that in the next few meetings, I'm going to listen for how many times my first response is to say, I'm sorry. 
And then I'm just going to start trying to stop myself from doing that and replacing that with new words and then putting some new words in place. So if you need more help, you know where to find me. Like I said, most of this stuff, I know that if you put some focus on it and some intention, you can actually tweak it on your own. Okay, I reached my 20 minutes. So uh, thank you for being with me. We do this every week. Like I said, they're archived on YouTube and on Spotify and on Apple Music, Apple Podcast, all the things. So with that, have a great week and I'll see you next week on Deep Work Fast.